so we're going to start this series. We're going to start this journey in Psalm 46. If you got your Bibles, take them out, turn to Psalm 46. If you don't have a Bible, you can go on YouTube. I'm sorry, you version on your app, or you can click on the tab to the right of me, and you can see Psalm 46 right there. And I know we're not here, but that shouldn't stop us from doing church like we usually do. So here's what we usually do. We usually stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm challenging you right where you are at home. Stand with me. And we do that because we are, we're, uh, we believe that the Word of God is worthy of our respect. So we are not hearing the words of man. We are hearing the very words of God. And because this is a little bit different of a service and, and we're not all here, we have a special video where I'm reading the scriptures with some cool imagery for you. So Psalm 46, hear the reading of God's word. Watch this. Psalm 46, to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Salah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Salah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Salah. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you are God in heaven, and you are Lord of creation. And in this moment, we ask that our hearts are receptive to every word you want to say. I pray that in this moment where we have a chance to corporately, though individually, silence the news, silence the updates, silence the social feed, that our hearts and our minds will be focused on you and we will hear from you and we will be transformed evermore into the image of of our strong Savior. Help us to see Jesus, him and him only. In his mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a seat. All right, if you've got the notes out, and again, the notes are on the tab right there as well, I encourage you to print them out, uh, well, fill them out as we go, and then print them out later. So fill in the blanks, just like we're doing it, as if we were all here. But I got a question for you. This is, this is a strange time, it's a crazy time. And in times of crazy, we have a question to answer about faith. Here's the question we've gotta answer. Simple question. Is my faith romantic or real? <laughs> is my faith romantic or real? I, I feel like there's a lot of Christians that have a romantic faith in Jesus. And, and romantic faith is not real faith. It's, it's, it's a lot like a romantic relationship with anybody else. Like you think about a romantic relationship with somebody. Um, some of you who have been married a long time, you're going to have to go way back into the recesses of your memory to remember those early days of your romance with the person that you're now spending the rest of your life with. If you remember back then, that first few moments of the, of the relationship, we call that the romantic stage, right? That's the romantic stage. Because romance is a feeling, really. It really is. It's a romantic feeling. It's a romantic time. 
We, we even talk about the romantic age of our history. Um, here's what romance is. Romance is all about myself. Romance is all about how that person makes me feel, right? This is what romance really is. And, and, I, and I think that there's a place for this in our human connection. But let's be honest, it doesn't last, right? It doesn't last. And everybody married over 10 years said, Amen, right? That doesn't last, okay? So romance, though, is those first few days, weeks, months, years of a relationship with someone. And when you see people in romantic love, it's so cute. They're so in love with each other. They're so enamored with each other. But really, they're usually enamored with the fact that that person likes them, loves them, thinks that they're worth their time. Romance is all about me. Here's the thing about a romantic relationship. It, it's never been tested. Like, like romance turns into a real relationship when the, te- when the commitment and the feelings and the love for each other starts to get tested. When we start getting hit with some stuff. Here's why I ask you about your faith being real or romantic. A lot of Christians have a romantic relationship with Jesus. They love how it makes them feel. Oh, there's a God in the universe, and he loves me. Wow! We even sing songs like that. We even sing songs about how God is for me, and, and God loves me, and, and, and he'll chase me down, and he'll find me, and he'll come after me, and it's wonderful to be loved by God, and that's true. It's wonderful to be loved by God, but how many know that that kind of relationship with God where it's all about us doesn't last, doesn't get you through? See, at some point... Your relationship with God has to move from romantic, feeling-oriented, um, uh, benefit-me-oriented to, okay, what are we in this for? Just like a good marriage. A good marriage, a good relationship with your spouse is not centered on what you want the marriage to do for you. A good relationship with your spouse is centered on what is God looking to do in us? What is God looking for us to create? This is why you have children. You know why? Because that child comes from both of you. And it unites you both, individual, into one. And you learn that that it's not about you anymore. It's about what you have produced. It's about what you have given into the world. What you have given to the world. What you have spawned into the world. That child is a representation of you coming together and choosing to love one another. And that child can function as a, as a daily, lifelong reminder that that, that relationship only produced when both members gave themselves to something bigger than themselves. So here's what I'm asking about your faith. Is it real or romantic? Romantic faith is what God can do for me. Here's real faith. Real faith is, God, what do you want to do through me? What do you want me to do in this world? What, What spiritual offspring do you want to produce through my life? And there's only really one ingredient that God uses regularly to turn your faith from romantic to real. There's only one ingredient, and here's the ingredient. It's one word, trouble. Trouble. Because, listen, that's what makes a relationship go from romantic to real, trouble. You know, a romantic relationship couple, a romance couple, you know, they're all about the feelings and everything, but their, their, their love and their commitment has not been tested by tough financial times. It has not been tested by questionable actions on the part of one or the other. It has not been tested by um, the uncertainty of the age. But when it gets trouble, when stuff starts to hit the fan, that's when the relationship can go from romantic to real. And it's no longer about me, it's about what we're doing together. God uses trouble to deepen our faith. That's what I'm trying to say. God uses trouble to deepen our faith and, and create a faith in us that is real and not romantic. Not feelings-based, but life legacy based. What am I leaving behind? See, here's what you got to do, parents, right now in your homes. Here's what you got to do. You've got to model for your children that now is not the time to panic. 
Now is not the time to throw up our hands and say, where is God? And I don't believe this. And life is terrible. No, now is the time to actually model for our children, model for our neighbors, that though the world looks like it's falling apart, I'm not. God's in control. And all things are going to work out for my good. But you've got to know that you're only going to get there. You're only going to make that transition through times of trouble. How many know that some of your closest relationships right now, some of the people that you're closest to, you're close to them because you went through trouble with them. You went through trouble with them. You, 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 you went through some really tough valley moments, and, and they stuck by you, and you stuck by them. And now I guarantee you that the people that you've been through trouble with, they're your, your band of brothers or sisters. They're the people that you call on, and you're still closest to to this day. I got friends in this church. I got family in this church. We went through 9-11 together. We went through the 2007-2008 financial crisis together. Now we're going through this together. And through all those troubles, we've gotten tighter. So here's what Psalm 46 is about. Psalm 46, it's actually a wartime psalm. And Psalm 40, I think it's 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. These psalms are wartime psalms. These are the songs that Israel was supposed to sing on their way into battle. That's why these are, these are relevant today, because we're in a battle right now. So these psalms, they would sing as a nation to remind themselves of who their God was and who they were so that they could fight and win the spiritual and physical battle before them. So I got five points from this psalm to help teach our hearts about what we do when trouble hits. Number one, when trouble hits, number one, I must, re I must reconnect with who God is. I must reconnect with who God is. Let me ask you something. Who is God to you? Who is God to you? For far too many people, God is the disapproving parent or judge, ready to strike you down when you mess up. He's not that. For far too many people, God is the cosmic killjoy who's always upset, who's, who's just not happy if you're happy. He just wants you to have no fun in life. That's not who God is. And then for some people, God is this distant celestial being that just kind of watches from afar and never really intervenes or does anything for us. That's not who God is. See, in the midst of trouble, Israel was to sing this song to reconnect with themselves, with their hearts, who their God was. What does verse 1 say? I love verse 1. Verse 1 of uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I love this. Okay, two things God is. Number one, he is our refuge. He is our refuge. Okay, so refuge could be translated shelter, and shelter is something that you get inside, right? In the midst of trouble, you get inside a shelter. My wife and I, we love those survival, those survival shows. We love um, a show. <laughs> it's called Naked and Afraid. How many naked and afraid people out there? Okay, not now. Not that you're naked and afraid now. I'm talking about the show. Okay, anyway, uh, we love the show. So anyway, they go out into the middle of nowhere. They're naked, and they got nothing, and they have to first do three things. Um, we, if you know the show, you know it. Shelter, or I think it's water, shelter, fire. Those three things. Water, shelter, fire. And I thought about this. Here's the deal. Shelter is like the second most important thing. Why? Because they need protection from the elements. Here's what the scripture says. In the midst of trouble, God is our protection. He is our shelter. He is our refuge. And then, second thing in that verse, verse 1, it says that he is our strength. That, that, that means that he's not just the external protection from the enemy and the, and the elements, He's also the internal empowerment of our bodies. See, here's what you have to understand. God does not live in buildings made by men. I'm standing in a building that was made by men. And I've told you this countless times from this stage, that this is not the church. This is a building. Before it was a church, this building was a jewelry manufacturing plant, okay? There's no steeple. There's no bell tower. There's nothing that looks churchy. And I kind of like that about our church because it reminds all of us that the church is not a building and God does not live here in this building and wait for us to show up every Sunday morning. Like, that's not how it works. No, God doesn't live in buildings. He lives in you. Scripture says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you are in Jesus, that is, 
If you believe in Jesus, if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, if you have confessed him with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit wherein God lives in you. And I'm going to tell you right now that the God in you is stronger than anything that's coming against you. You've got to understand this when you feel the fear around you. He is not just shelter from the external extremities and elements of the world. He is also internal reality who can empower you through what we're going through. Christian, you need to do this right now because you have an opportunity to do it. You need to get alone with God and you need to just declare to yourself, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That comes from the Bible. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. He's not just external protection. He's internal fortification. Amen? Number two, when trouble hits, I must realign my trust in God alone. I must realign my trust in God alone. Let me explain this point, and then I'll get to the passage. You see, the thing about Israel, our our faith, we're Christians, okay? We're Christians because we believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, so Christians follow Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ was a Jew. He was a son of David. He was a son of Abraham. And the Jewish people were an ancient nomadic people from about uh, 1500 B.C. And it starts with a guy named Abraham, and it continues with a guy named Moses, and then on and on down through the, the saints and the patriarchs of old. And here's what we, we, we forget in our modern age. In our modern age, we forget this. The belief in one God who created everything does not come naturally to mankind. We had to get a hold of that truth through revelation. God revealed himself to Abraham. God revealed himself to Moses. He revealed himself to the people of Israel. And it's kind of interesting because this is still true today. Even when they find remote villages of people that are kind of disconnected from civilization, they find this true time and time again. Most of the time, the tendency of the human heart is to worship the created thing as God. So in ancient times... They would worship the sun as God. In fact, the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, believed that the sun was God. They also believed that cows were God. In fact, still in India today, there's parts of India where they still worship cows as deities. All over the world, still in in the ancient world, the creation was sacred. Trees were sacred. Mountains were sacred. We still hear about this today when they want to when they want to move something onto possible sacred space on, or sacred land. And here's the tendency of the human heart. This has been our problem from creation. We worship creation over the creator. Now, why does that matter? Because whatever you worship is what you trust. Whatever you worship, and, and worship is just an old word, it's just a word that we get from the old English word, worship. That thing right there is so worth it to me. I, I think that, uh, for instance, I think that having this big house is the most important thing about my life. So I will work for it, I will aim for it, I will put all my hope in that, and when I have that big house, then I will feel like I'm actually, you know, finally arrived. That's just worship. And so we do this till today. We're, we're just like the ancient pagans. They worship the sun, they worship the moon, they worship rocks and stones and all that kind of stuff. All right, well, well, we worship like other people or we worship money or we worship stuff or, or we worship things that we can acquire to make ourselves think that we have finally arrived. And here's the deal. Whatever we worship is what we're trusting to make us who we are. And here's what trouble does for the children of God. Trouble helps us realign our trust in God alone. Let's go to the verse. Verse two. Therefore, we will not fear, look at this, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Okay, look at the list in verse 2 and 3. I hope it's still up on the screen. Verse 2 and 3. Look at the list of events, right? The, the earth giving way, mountains into the sea. Right? The, the water's foaming. The mountains, like, could you imagine what would happen if we had an earthquake 
and a tsunami at the same time in the same place. I mean, people would freak out, right? Here's what the psalmist is saying. No matter what the creation does, I don't fear because my hope is in the creator. You see the difference? Israel gave us the belief. Abraham, Moses were revealed from the God of heaven. They had the revelation from the God of heaven that what everybody else worships as God, your God created. Your God holds in the palm of his hand. And so it's not about what happens in the world. We know who holds the world. As Christians, it's not about what we have or what we don't have. Because we know who has us. Therefore, we will not fear. Because the God we serve created it all. That's how the Bible opens, right? That's how, that's how this book opens, right? Remember, I'll remind you, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, he's, he's our father. He's also our creator. So here's, here's what this moment is for you guys. Here's what this moment is. And maybe this moment is for somebody who has not been to church for years, and this moment has awakened you to tune in and watch this. Here's what God is trying to say to you right now. Don't trust what you see, touch, taste, and feel. Trust in me. I am Lord over it all. I created it all. And, and by the way, he's saying to you, I created you. I love you. I have a plan and a purpose for you. Yes, enjoy what I've made, but if you lose it, know that you haven't lost me. Know that I'm still here to help you and strengthen you. That is God's word for you in the midst of this. Number three, when trouble hits. When num number three, when trouble hits. I must rest in the work of Christ's salvation. I must rest in the work of Christ's salvation. Okay. Let me explain this point, and then we'll get to the text. The, the psalm begins with trouble. Earth giving way, mountains into the sea, trembling earthquakes, tsunamis, and then it also it ends with trouble. The nations roar, the, the, uh, the, the nations rage, the people march out in, in, in ar ar army fashion to attack God's people. So you've got creation getting upended, you've got people getting nasty to each other, but right in the middle, I love this about the psalm, you gotta look at the psalm, they're poetic, but they're poetic for a reason. Right in the middle of the psalm, there's a river. Look what it says, verse four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Okay. What is this? What, what, what is this meaning of a river? Okay, I, I looked this up in the scriptures and I realized something about the scriptures. The scriptures are very clear that rivers are a picture of our salvation. And I, and I want to show you this really cool. Over and over again, I got five symbols of a river or five pictures of a river in scripture. Letter A in your notes there. Rivers in scripture and in nature, by the way, are a symbol of peace. Right? They're a symbol of peace. You, you know the old song, uh, shall we gather by the river? Or I've got peace like a river. We never say I've got peace like an ocean. <laughs> right? Because an ocean is kind of temptuous and, and crazy. And a river is typically gentle and mild. It's a symbol of peace. Uh, letter B. It's a source of life. Now you think about this. This is very, this is very simple. But you've got to think about this. It's a, sim it's a source of life. You can't drink the ocean's water. If you drink the ocean's water, you die. It's a very ironic thing. It's huge masses of water, we can't drink it. A river, you can typically drink the water. It's a source of life. Letter C, it's a stable boundary in Scripture. In Scripture, uh, rivers are constantly referred to as a stable boundary. In fact, the Euphrates is referred to as a boundary, and, and the Tigris and other rivers are usually boundary markers to, to mark out where we belong. Think about that, where we belong. And then letter D, a, a river is a, so, a place of cleansing. So we know this in the scriptures. And, and if you think about it, before there was running water in our homes, there were rivers. Like if you wanted to get into running water to wash yourself off, you had to get into rivers. And so it was a place of cleansing. And, and there's a place in 2 Kings 5 where Naaman the leper goes into the waters of the Jordan to wash and be cleansed. 
In fact, baptism typically happened in rivers where people got physically cleansed, but also referring to their spiritual cleansing through the washing of water of the river. And then letter E, and this is important, a place of divine revelation. And I like this one the best. Time and time and time again in the scriptures, this is so cool, God shows up in a, next to a river. Why? Because, because of what I'm about to say. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel sees the Son of Man by the Tigris River. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel starts to see God's visions and prophetic word by the Kabar River. And most notably, all Christians know this, Jesus goes down to the Jordan River and he comes out of the water and John the Baptist gets a revelation from heaven. The, 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 the voice comes, the spirit descends, and, and, and God says, this is my beloved son. And John the Baptist has a revelation of Jesus, who he is, at the river. And you say, well, why are you talking about this? Because here's what I think that river in Psalm 46 represents for us. I believe that river is pointing to our salvation in Jesus. Now think about it. Let's look at those letters again. What is Jesus? He is a symbol of peace. He is our peace. Number, letter B, he is our source of life. Uh, he is our boundary. He marks out where we belong. He is our place of cleansing. He washes away our sin. And then divine revelation. When you come to Jesus, you get to know who God is. You're no longer in the dark. See, he's the light. He's the way. He's the, he's the truth. And when you come to Christ, you know God, and you, la and you have the life of God in you. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 7, 37, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, here's a great thing you can do right now during this crisis, since you have to stay away from people, is get on your knees, close your eyes, and just imagine yourself with Jesus. Just imagine, he's just, just picture Jesus right there with you. He's the river whose streams make glad the city of God. Mm. Number four, when trouble hits, I must remember God is ultimately in charge. I don't, I don't have to do much explanation here. I don't have to do much, but I wanna just do a little. Verse eight. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease the ends of the, to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. So the psalmist moves from natural disasters to man-made disasters. And how many know our world is full of both? <laughs> our world has natural disasters and man-made disasters. And this this virus thing right now, it's kind of a combination of both, isn't it? You see the news, you're listening to it. It's all the noise, all the rancor, all the talk. Who can we blame? So is it natural? Is it man-made? Is it a combination of both and all this stuff? Here's what we have to remember. God is in charge of both. He's Lord over all. And he's in charge. Here's what scripture says about the natural created order. In Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He, that is Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. He made the world with his word and he upholds the world with his word. How about nations? How about leaders? How about kings? Well, Daniel chapter two, verse 21. Love this passage. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. You know who's in charge nationally in our world right now? Guess who put them there? God put them there. You say, well, some of them I don't like. Some of them I want to vote out. Some of them I want to vote in. It doesn't matter what you want. God's going to put in who he wants and take out who he wants. So why do I say that? Because you don't have to worry about that. Am I telling you not to vote? No, I'm telling you, Trust God in the process. The people that are in charge right now, God has in his hand. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17 says, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing, an emptiness. See, some, right now you're probably getting all worked up about the nations and, and this nation and that nation. Wait a second, that's nothing compared to God. That's nothing compared to who he is. 
He's the Lord of the universe. You don't have to get worried about, about a nation. It's like, it's like an ant on the pathway, and, and you're worried about the ant. It's like God's like, that's just that's the nations to me. Don't you know who I am? And then I love Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. In this time of crisis, I think we need, as the church, to do what 1 Timothy chapter 2 says. We need to pray for kings and those in authority. We need to pray for our president, pray for our governors, pray for our senators, pray for our congressmen and women. Pray that God will lead them and guide them. We don't have to freak out. And, and, and if I was to be absolutely honest to me, this, is, this, is, this thought has been going through my head these couple of weeks. Um, to me, this feels like a global timeout, doesn't it? Like, parents know what I'm talking about. You got, if you got kids, timeout is like the ultimate punishment. Timeout. Put them over there in the corner, make them sit, make them think about what they've done. And I think about this, like this moment is like a global timeout for humanity, where God is just so sick of us fighting each other and hating each other and pointing the finger at each other and being kids and brats and blaming everybody else. God's like, all right, that's it. Entire globe, time out. <laughs> Go sit in the corner and think about what you've done. And <laughs> hopefully we'll learn the lesson. And instead of demonizing each other, we'll start to appreciate each other. Instead of, instead of thinking like that, th that person over there is the, my enemy, no, no, no. Now we'll start thinking, wait, they're my brother. They're my sister. They're part of the human family. We're in this together. Anyway, that wasn't in my notes. Just put that in for free. Maybe it's God's global timeout. He's ultimately in charge. He's our father. And last thing, number five, when trouble hits, I must resign from trying to control my life and surrender to God. This is the, this is the big point. This is the big point. When trouble hits, it's a chance for you to resign. So we're just, we're just natural control freaks, aren't we? Like some of you, when you started to hear the news about this crisis coming up, you ran to the store and you stocked up, didn't you? You did. You got piles of toilet paper right now in your bathroom, right? You got piles of it because you're a control freak. Ain't nobody going to control me. I'm going to have toilet paper until Jesus comes. That's it. I mean, that's, that's how you feel right now. Like, that's it. And some of you, you know, you're, you're, you're getting angry. You're getting so mad because you can't do what you want to do. Can I tell you something? My pinch, you're a control freak. <laughs> you got to learn to let go. You know, what this whole virus and this whole epidemic is teaching us, pandemic is teaching us, we're not in charge. And anybody who thinks they are is pretending. He's in charge. So let me just look at this last verse. It's not the last verse in the psalm, but it's the key verse in the psalm. Verse, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Look at that verse again, because what did it just say? Be still. Now, I read a commentator on this verse, and I thought, fantastic how he put it. He said, this is not a call to calm tranquility and meditation. No, 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 no. It's actually an imperative command to shut up. <laughs> in other words, the psalmist is telling you, God's people, in the midst of crisis, shut up. <laughs> He's in charge. And, and if you don't shut up, you will miss it. If you don't stop it, if you don't stop freaking out, getting angry, trying to take back control of the life you think you have control of, but you never did, you are going to miss what God wants to say to you. And my prayer through this crisis is that you hear him and you know him. Know that I am God, he says. Know that I am God. 
And then that last, that last sentence, look at it. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I will be exalted among the nations. That's human disasters. And I will be exalted in the earth. That's natural disasters. And here's my prayer. I've been praying this. I want you to pray it with me, Waters Church. I want you to pray it with me. Here's my prayer for this crisis, okay? Because I was there at 9-11. Not at 9-11, but I was there during 9-11. I was around. And I was also around and preaching during the 2008 financial crisis. And I remember what happened. I remember. Here's what happened. Everybody freaked out, turned to God, and then soon after, forgot all about him. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Don't you understand that the trouble that has come upon us is to remind us he's God. And my prayer, my prayer is that God will be exalted through all of this. And listen. It's a prayer that I know is going to get answered because he says it right there in verse 10. I will be exalted. I'll be exalted in the nations. The nations are going to know they're not in charge. I'm in charge. And I will be exalted in the earth. The earth is going to know it's not in charge. I'm in charge. The only question that this psalm asks us to answer is this simple question. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of disaster, will God be exalted in you? That's up to you. That's your choice right now. And God is saying to you in this moment, surrender to me. Stop putting your faith in the created things your friends, your stuff, your, your possessions, your, your acclaim, your achievements, your, all that stuff. Stop freaking out about who's in charge and who's on, in, in, in the offices of power in this country. Stop. Stop looking at the news and thinking that it actually determines what's real. And look up to heaven. And say, Father, I surrender to you.